Okay, so uh, now that we've thought about throwing objects around, uh, in this section we're going to discuss, among other things, uh, ramps. Why is it that using a ramp we can change the elevation of an object that's so heavy that we couldn't otherwise lift it? And implicitly, you know, why do we move faster when we bike down a steep hill rather than a less steep hill? Why is it hard to bike uphill in the first place? So on and so forth. Uh, so we're going to start this uh, series of questions out by thinking about weight and gravity. Uh, weight and gravity. Uh, and contrasting the following two situations, right? So we saw earlier that an object's weight is... Um, sorry, I'm distracted by the roofers working above me. Uh, the object's weight is uh, the force with which the Earth's gravitational field is trying to pull that object towards the Earth's center, right? And when an object is in free fall, that force causes an acceleration, right? So if we have, again, our canonical apple with its tiny green stem, um, and there's a force of gravity acting on it, causing it to accelerate downwards, right? Um, but what happens when an object isn't in free fall, right? We know from experience that if we start with um, our other canonical example, a book on a table, uh, we know that the book sitting on a table still has weight. You know, if uh, you try to pick it up, you have to exert a force in order to do so. If an object is sitting not on the table, but say is sitting on your foot, you can feel the weight of that object pressing against you. Um, and the more massive an object is, um, the more force that we feel that pressure with. Um, but certainly in this situation, we don't see the book accelerating. I mean, it's not moving at all. Um, and so what is it that's, uh, that's going on in this situation? You know, book not moving? Uh, what's going on is Newton's third law of motion. Newton's third law, the third of the, uh, of the three kind of canonical foundations of classical mechanics, of the study of how objects around us uh, move. And what Newton's third law says is that uh, for every force, uh, for every force that, um, let's say, object A exerts on object B, for instance, A could be the book and B could be the table, uh, for every force that A exerts on B, um, the object B, the second, uh, the second object, simultaneously, simultaneously uh, exerts a force on A, which is equal in magnitude, which is equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction opposite in direction, okay? And this law is sometimes summarized, uh, maybe you've heard it this way, as uh, for every action, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. There is an equal and opposite reaction. Uh, this expression feels uh, much more poetic, um, but this expression here is, I think, more explicit and sometimes easier to, to think about. Um, so, okay, uh, let's, uh, let's think about Newton's third law then in the context of what we have going on here. Right? So on the one hand, let's suppose we have our book in free fall. It's got a bunch of pages. Um, we know that gravity is acting on this book, giving us uh, a force of gravity, which is the mass of the book times the acceleration due to gravity, and it's accelerating downwards. What happens when we have our book sitting on a table? What happens when we have um, our book sitting on a table? Well, the Earth is exerting a force on the book. Okay, so. The Earth is exerting a force on the book, um, and it's the same thing we wrote over there. The book still has uh, the same weight, right? Now, in turn, it's still true, of course, that the book is exerting a gravitational pull on the Earth, uh, but the book is so insignificant uh, in comparison to the Earth that we can neglect that uh, for now when we're analyzing the situation. You know, the fact that the Earth is pulling a, the book down also means that the book is exerting a downward force um, on the table itself. So this force of gravity acting on the book is the same as the force with which the book pushes on the table. Okay, and again, it's uh, the, the way in which the book is pushing on the table is exactly the same way that gravity is pulling the book down. 
right? So again, it's just the mass of the book times the acceleration due to gravity. Now, Newton's third law says that when an object exerts a force on another object, that second object exerts an equal and opposite force back on the first. So while the book is pushing on the table, um, that means the table is pushing back on the book. Force, um, table, pushing on book. Uh, it's opposite in direction, so the book is pushing straight down, the table is pushing straight up, um, and the magnitudes are the same. So the magnitude of the force down here is m times the acceleration due to gravity. The magnitude of the force with which the table pushes back is also uh, the mass of the book times the acceleration due to gravity. Okay. So if we now say, for instance, what is the net force on the book? Force, you know, net on book. We can see that the book is experiencing two forces. It's being pulled down by gravity, and it's being pushed up by the table. And those two vector forces are perfectly balanced. So the net force, in fact, is zero. And that is why the acceleration of the book is also zero, because it experiences no net forces. And so we know from Newton's second law that that means it will not change its velocity. Okay. Um, that's fantastic. So there are all these forces um, acting, and what happens to an object depends only on the forces acting on that object. You know, people sometimes misunderstand Newton's third law with the following uh, kind of reasoning. You know, you might say, "Well, I'm pushing on an object. The object is pushing back exactly as hard, exactly as hard. These forces all cancel, and so nothing happens." And the point is, that's not correct. You have to think about separately all of the forces as they act on different objects. The different forces in Newton's third law talk about the forces acting on different objects. I exert a force on an object, the object exerts a force on me. What happens to each of those objects depends on the total set of forces acting on them. Um, for instance, let's go back to our skating example and suppose you know, I'm on my frictionless skates and I push against a wall. Right? So I exert a force on the wall and the wall exerts a force on me. Okay. So I guess I draw a tiny terrible cartoon. Um, so I've got a massive wall, I've got me on ice skates, I am not an artist, I've got one very long arm that I'm pushing against the wall with, and the wall pushes back against me, right, with an equal and opposite magnitude, uh, equal magnitude opposite direction to how I push on the wall, okay. So let's think about this from the perspective of me. The set of forces that I'm experiencing include uh, gravity, it includes the ice underneath these skates supporting me. So there's um, a support force, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, support force. Uh, and since I'm not accelerating up or down, you know, I'm not sinking into the ice, we know those forces balance. And then there's this force of the wall on me. So these are the set of forces acting just on me. I look at this diagram and I see that that means that the net force, net force on me is the force with which the wall pushes me, right? There's kind of one unbalanced force uh, right here, and so that will determine how I accelerate. Okay. Now let's think about things from the wall's perspective. You know, from the wall's perspective, I mean, again, gravity is pushing down on the wall. Whatever the wall is standing on is pushing back. The wall probably has lots of, like, architectural supports. And these architectural supports, you know, transfer, uh, you know, can help transfer forces into the ground to give a restoring force. So I push on the wall, the wall's supports push back against the wall, and the wall doesn't accelerate. So you have to think about uh, Newton's third law as telling you how the force of one object on another tells you about the set of forces acting on both of those objects, and you need to analyze those uh, separately in order to figure out what's moving and what's not moving. So we kind of alluded to this up above uh, just now, but let's talk about what these support forces are. And these support forces are sometimes called the normal forces. Okay. So um, let's suppose I have an object sitting on the ground, and we've kind of discussed already that you know gravity is pulling the object down, and if the object is just sitting there, um, we know it's somehow being supported because there has to be a balancing force so that there's no net force on this object so that we correctly identify that its acceleration is zero. 
right? So what is the nature of these supporting forces that stop the object um, from sinking into the ground or from going through a table? The basic idea here um, is that objects can't occupy can't occupy the same physical space at the same time. Space at the same time. Right? And the consequences of that is that if you bring two objects into contact, their surfaces repel each other. They push each other apart whenever they're in contact. And the direction the direction of this kind of repelling force is um, perpendicular to the surface, perpendicular to the surface. And normal is just another math word for perpendicular. So that's why these are sometimes called normal forces rather than support forces or the word here, perpendicular forces. Normal is another word for perpendicular. Okay, so um, let's kind of see that in a few contexts. If I have a flat object resting on flat ground, the surfaces are in this perfectly horizontal direction, and that means the way that the ground repels the object perpendicular to its own surface, that's straight in the vertical direction. So that tells me that the normal force or the support force is going to be pointing in this direction. You know, the fact that um, the object is not moving, the fact that it has no acceleration, means that the magnitude of the normal force, which I'll denote with these like absolute value signs around the vector quantity. Um, the fact that it's not sinking into the ground means that this has to be perfectly balancing with you know, whatever force is trying to bring these objects into contact. So if that's the force of gravity, and the force of gravity's magnitude is mg, the magnitude of the normal force is also mg. Right? And again, the principle here is that we know the object's not accelerating. That means there has to be no net force on it. So this has to be the, uh, the situation. You know, a block resting on the ground isn't flying up into the air, so the support force can't be bigger than gravity, and it's not sinking into the ground, so it can't be less than gravity either. Okay. Now, um, that also means that surfaces, you know, respond to the weight of the object that they're supporting. So if I suddenly jump on top of this, uh, on top of this block, you know, suddenly the force of gravity that's pulling this combined set down changes from, you know, just the mass of the block times gravity to that plus the mass of me times gravity. And that means, you know, the support force also very quickly responds. The surface responds to me jumping on the block by pushing back harder. Um, so this magnitude also balances this out, growing to mass of me uh, times the acceleration due to gravity. And you know, it's a property of materials, that different materials have a different maximum amount of support force that they're capable of supplying um, over their surface area. What happens if you put too much weight on an object? Uh, that object breaks. Or you've got mud, mud can support you know, some amount of weight. If you put too much weight on, you sink a little. What happens there? You accelerate down a little, and, but at the same time you compress the mud, making it denser, and denser mud can support more force than loose mud. And so eventually you come to a new, uh, a new resting position. Uh, okay, so normal forces on flat ground at some level are very intuitive. Um, and you know, if I take this example and I could say the force of gravity, let me write that as you know, it's acting straight down. So that's zero times minus mg. So zero in the x and y directions, and it's mg pointing down. And that means I could write the support force as equal but opposite in direction. So I could write that as zero and then positive mg. Right? Things get a little bit more complicated when you're not on flat ground, but when you're on, say, a sloped surface. Right? So now, instead, let me imagine that I'm starting to think about ramps. Right? So I have um, a ramp or a wedge of ground with some angle theta, and I have the same block resting on that sloped surface. Okay. Now, I told you that the normal forces, these support forces, only act in the directions perpendicular to the surfaces themselves. And that means that the support force in this case is acting in this direction, right? It's acting perpendicular to 
uh, this slope, right? So this is the support force. On the other hand, it's still the case that gravity is pulling the object straight down, right? Straight down, and that's not a very straight line. Okay. So the force of gravity here is the same as it was um, is the same as it was over there. That's given by zero in the x and y direction and mg in the downwards y direction. So we're calling that minus mg, I suppose. Okay, well, uh, let's decompose this force of gravity into the component that's in the direction of this support force and the component that's not. So let me draw this kind of triangle representing the components of this vector, not in the x and y direction, but in the up the slope direction and perpendicular to the slope direction. Right. So what are the lengths of these legs of the triangle? <clears throat> well, this one, just using trigonometry and realizing that this angle is also theta, this length is just m times g times the cosine of theta. Okay. And this length, that's m g times the sine of theta. So something uh, to realize here is that the magnitude of our support force is not equal to the magnitude of the force of gravity, right? Because the support force is only acting in this direction. So it only needs to stop the block from accelerating kind of into the slope, into the ramp, right? So the magnitude of this is not the whole force of gravity. It's only this leg of the triangle. So instead, we get that the magnitude of the support force is equal to mg cosine theta. Okay. It perfectly balances out this component of the, fo of the force of gravity, of the block's weight, in the direction into the slope. Right? And one of the things that means is that in this situation, this object still has a net force acting on it. Right? There's a force of gravity pulling straight down. There's a support force resisting some component of that total force. But I still have basically this leg of the triangle as a leftover bit of force. And so in fact, there's a net force here um, whose magnitude is m times g times the sine of theta. Okay? So if this is a frictionless ramp, then the block will slide off the ramp, right? And we've seen stuff like this before. Um, if we go to a low friction environment, like I have uh, you know, this notepad, and I put it at an angle so that it's like a ramp, and then I have an object, uh, that object slides down because there's still a net force on it. You know, this pen doesn't go into the page because the page resists the pen's weight in that direction. But there's nothing stopping it from sliding down, in this case except friction, and friction is not strong enough uh, to keep the pen in place. Okay, so from this diagram, actually we already, I think, have a sense of why ramps help us move things up and down. Right? Um, if we neglect friction, you know, the net force acting on this block is, again, this component, uh, mg times sine theta. And, you know, remember that theta, sine of theta is something that, you know, uh, if this angle is zero, the sine of theta is zero. If this angle is 90 degrees, the sine of theta is one. So mg sine theta is some number which is in between zero and one in this case. Okay? So it's less than the total weight of the block. Remember the total weight weight of the block is mg, the full you know, mass times acceleration due to gravity. Um, so if we wanted to slide this block up the hill, we would just need to supply a force by pushing on it, uh, by pushing on it with a force of that push, which is just, you know, it, just a tiny bit bigger than whatever this force is. And if we do so, it will start accelerating up the ramp, right? Contrast that with the case if you're trying to lift it straight up, lift this block straight up, you have to fight against the full force of gravity. Um, and the full force of gravity means trying to push upwards with mg rather than push at an angle with mg sine theta. Now the trade-off you don't get you know, uh, a free lunch, is that we have to supply that force over a longer distance. If we want to lift a block from here to here, we have to supply mg worth of force upward over this height. 
if we want to move a block from down here to up here, we have to supply, okay, less force, mg sine theta, but we have to do it over the entire length of this hypotenuse, which is going to be more than the total height here, right? So that's kind of the trade-off that we make when we're using a ramp. And that's fine, because for most people, the constraint is the maximum amount of force you can supply at a given time. Your muscles are only so strong, and you're willing to work over a longer distance so that you don't have to supply as much force. Okay, that brings us very naturally into uh, the next section of these notes. Still ultimately thinking about uh, ramps, but where we're going to talk about energy and work for the first time. And energy is one of the most important uh, concepts in physics because it is a physically conserved quantity. There are actually relatively few conserved quantities in physics, things that, that never change. Um, and so when you find one, you can do an enormous amount of, uh, well, forgive the pun, you can do an enormous amount of work. You can do an enormous amount of intellectual work with them. Okay. So um, as I define them, these definitions of energy at work might at first seem a little bit circular, but I hope by the end of this section we'll have an appreciation for, for what I mean. Um, so first, let me just remind you of the units of both of these quantities, uh, units and dimensions. Uh, the dimensions of an energy, which are the same as the dimensions of a work, and these are both scalar quantities, they don't have a direction associated with them, they just have a, a magnitude. Um, this is like mass times length squared, divided by time squared, okay? And uh, that's the same as the dimensions of a force, which is mass times length divided by two powers of time, uh, times a distance. And we'll see why this kind of representation of energies and works being f like forces times distances um, will make sense in a little bit. Okay, so what are, these, what are these quantities? What is this conserved quantity energy and what is work? Um, energy, this is the part which is going to seem very circular. Um, I'm going to define it as the capacity to do work. Uh, great. Um, work, uh, I'm going to define as the process of transferring energy. OK. Now, let's start unpacking these, uh, these definitions um, in a few different ways. So first, I want to point out that energy can take many forms. Energy can take many forms. OK, um, one of the most important uh, forms that we'll see in this class is the so-called kinetic energy of an object. Um, and the kinetic energy of an object is equal to one half times the mass of that object times its velocity squared. Okay, that's one form of energy. So moving objects um, have an energy associated with them. Um, another extremely important one is, let's say, gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy, let's say, of an object near the Earth's surface, and we're thinking about the Earth in this case, um, is equal to the mass of that object times the acceleration due to gravity times the height of that object. Okay? These are two of the ones that we'll be using the most, especially uh, in this chapter and the next, but there's lots of other ones. Um, so uh, for instance, uh, an elastic material, like a rubber band, um, has elastic energy. If you stretch a rubber band, it's in uh, a state that has more elastic energy, and it can suddenly uh, do some work if you need it to. Um, there's like chemical energy. So the molecules in gasoline store a certain amount of chemical energy, and when we burn gasoline, we can release and use some of that. There's the energy that's stored similarly in like the molecules of the foods that we uh, consume that we ultimately turn into what powers our muscles and everything, uh, so on and so forth. One of the key points is that energy is conserved. Energy is conserved. And what does that mean? It means you can neither create nor destroy it. Create nor destroy energy. Uh, you can only convert it from one form to another. Only uh, convert from one form to another. 
in the process of uh, converting or transferring energy from one form into another is called work. Uh, it's fantastic. Actually, um, the recommended textbook that we're using has something of a nice analogy that might help you kind of think about why this isn't a circular definition. Let's suppose we live in a fictitious economy where there's a fixed total amount of currency in the world. Okay? So energy in this world uh, or in this analogy is like money and work is like spending. Okay? So you can have money in many different forms. You can have dollars or euros or pesos or yen or whatever. Uh, and you can certainly convert money from one form to another. That's something you can do. And you can also transfer money from you to someone else, right? The process of transferring money is called spending, right? I spend money uh, to get something, and I give that money to uh, my grocery store, which is basically these days all we're spending money on. Um, you know, it might feel circular to define money as the capacity to spend, but it's a definition you could adopt. Um, and so maybe that analogy helps you a little bit. Think about this energy as the capacity to do work, and work is the process of transferring this energy around, either from one object to another or from one form to another. Okay. Um, so we can think a little bit about a simple example of this process of you know, converting energy from one form to another. Suppose I uh, am standing here. Ooh, it's a particularly bad stick figure. And at some moment in time, I toss a tennis ball up in the air with some velocity. Okay. So this is at t equals zero. You know, that uh, tennis ball will go up in the air. Sorry, it will go up. All the while being slowed down by gravity, eventually it'll stop, and then it'll start falling back down. Right? So what's going on in that whole process? So at t equals zero, not six, at t equals zero, um, this ball has kinetic energy. The kinetic energy of the tennis ball uh, is equal to one half times its mass times whatever velocity I gave it, right? And I got this tennis ball up to velocity by doing some amount of work. You know, my muscles consumed some chemical energy. I converted that chemical energy through my muscles into kinetic energy by acting with a force uh, to accelerate this tennis ball up to some speed. I let it go. It's got a velocity. So at first, the kinetic energy of this tennis ball um, is one half times its mass times whatever its initial velocity is squared. Uh, the whole time that it's traveling, though, gravity is pointing in the downward direction, as we saw in some of our previous examples of trajectories. So eventually, like let's say at t equals 1, it's all the way up at the top. You know, t equals 1 second. Maybe it got all the way up to the top of its trajectory, and it's not moving at all. So in this case, the kinetic energy is 0, because it not moving at all means its velocity is 0. But energy is conserved, and so that kinetic energy must have gone somewhere. Where did it go? Where did kinetic energy go? It went into, in this case, the gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy, which is equal to the mass of the tennis ball times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. And since energy is conserved, actually, you can already work out a relationship between how high did it get? How high did the tennis ball get at the point where the velocity was equal to zero, well, all of the kinetic energy had to flow into gravitational potential energy. That means I can set these two equations equal to each other and say mgh, this measure of gravitational potential energy, had to be equal to the kinetic energy that the tennis ball started out with, one half mv squared. So you can see by rearranging this, these masses cancel, apparently the height, the maximum height that the ball attains relative to wherever it started out, um, is apparently uh, v squared divided by 2 times the acceleration due to gravity, just by thinking about the conservation of energy. You know, this is also something that we could have eventually figured out using some of these equations. If I told you exactly what the initial velocity was, you could figure out at what time does it uh, have a velocity such that the acceleration of gravity over that time balanced out the initial velocity, giving v equals 0. And then you could plug that time into this expression to figure out how high the tennis ball got. But just by thinking about the conservation of energy, you can immediately figure out that all of the kinetic energy had to go into gravitational energy. So this is how high the, uh, the tennis ball got. OK. Um, so uh, fantastic. We're moving right along. 2.4.3.
the process of doing work. Okay, so what is involved in actually doing work on an object? And I kind of hinted at this when I talked about what it meant when I, you know, took a tennis ball that was initially just sitting still in my hand and then, you know, throwing it up in the air. Um, you can do work, uh, we do work, by applying a force, again, I'm sorry about the noises in the background, if you can hear them, uh, applying a force to an object over a distance, over a distance. Another way that you might want to write this is as the object moves in the direction of that force. So again, for that tennis ball, I throw a tennis ball by using my muscles to apply a baseball uh, to apply a force over a certain distance. So if I'm you know throwing it up like this, you know uh, I have a tennis ball that starts at rest here. I apply force over some distance and then I let go. Um, so there's a magnitude of force that I apply. There's a direction of force that I apply, and there's a distance over which I am applying that force. Okay, and I'm ultimately converting the chemical energy stored in how my body breaks down food to a combination both of body heat and the kinetic energy of the tennis ball. So the definition, definition of, let's say, mechanical work is work is given by the dot product of a force times a displacement over which you apply that force. Okay. So if I you know, have a block and I apply a force in this direction, and I apply that steadily pushing while it moves in the same direction, then this is just normal multiplication. You know, so if I'm applying this force. On the other hand, if I apply a force that's in um, a slightly different direction from how it moves, only the component of force in the direction matters. So um, you can remember from uh, your math classes uh, that this dot product, you can write it in a few different ways. One way of writing it is the magnitude of the force times the magnitude of the displacement multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. So if I you know, push this way and I move this way, um, the angle between the force and the direction is zero. They're in the same direction. So that's just magnitude of force times magnitude of displacement times 1. So that's just f times d. If I'm pushing up, but I'm only moving horizontally, um, there's an angle between the direction I'm pushing and the direction that my hand is moving. So that's when you need this, uh, this angle, right? Um, that's great. So it's important to kind, of, um, to kind of think about the fact that the definition of work in physics sometimes feels a little bit different than what our intuition is. You know, if I'm pushing really hard against a wall, it certainly feels like I'm doing work, you know, like the generic colloquial English version of work. Um, but I'm not doing work on the wall. The wall is not moving, so the displacement of the wall is zero. So that means that the work that I've done on the wall is zero. Now, it's still true that like uh, I'm applying a force and some chemical work is being done. In this case, you know, I'm burning calories uh, and converting that into body heat, basically. But I'm not doing work on the wall. You only do work on an object if that object moves as you apply force to it. Okay. Um, another point that I want to make is that uh, forces, we know from Newton's third law, come in equal and opposite pairs, right? And this is one of the keys to realizing why energy is actually conserved. So for instance, if I lift an object up, I apply a force on that object in the upward direction, and the object moves in the upward direction. So I'm doing positive work on the object. At the same time, the object is pushing down on my hand, right? Like I have this pen, it's got a weight, it's pushing down against me. But while it's pushing down, um, the object is moving up in this scenario. So it's pushing in the direction opposite to its displacement. The magnitude of the push is the same magnitude as you know, the force that I'm applying upwards. So while I do positive work to the object, the object does negative work to me. I do positive work, it, do, it does negative work, energy gets transferred, but the total amount of energy in the universe stays the same. Stays the same. Great. Um, I guess I should also say, you know, this expression um, assumes that we're applying a constant force over the distance that's involved. Um, 
this is another one of those things, just like the constant acceleration case we saw earlier, that um, if we knew calculus, we could generalize that to time-varying forces. But in this class, um, we'll just stick with the constant force uh, scenario. Okay. So now that we have these notions of support forces, but also energies and works, we're finally ready to understand um, how to use a ramp, or why ramps make our life easier. Okay, why is it that using a ramp makes it easier, in some sense, to move an object up? Okay, and um, let's suppose that I've got a block of material that has a mass of 50 kilograms, and I wanna, uh, what do I have? I have a house. My house actually only has one floor, but you know, let's pretend I wanna bring this block, maybe it's a couch or something, up to the second story. So I wanna lift it, um, let's say a total of three meters upwards. So what could I do? How could I apply forces? How could I exert works in order to bring this uh, 50 kilogram blob from ground level up to the second story, up to three meters in the air? Uh, option one. Option one would be to lift straight up. You know, I could lean out this window with some ropes and just, just pull straight up. Lift straight up. And what do I need to do in order to do that? I've got the block sitting on the ground. Gravity is pulling it down. So the force uh, of gravity, the weight of this object, um, is the mass, 50 kilograms, times the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, and I would need to supply that force over a distance of three meters. So my formula from back up here would say, okay, I want to apply a force in the straight up direction, and I want to move the block in the straight up direction. So in this case, the work of you know, option one is to, take, um, is to take the force that I have to apply, force dotted into uh, the displacement, and I've chosen my direction so that this is uh, very easy. The angle between the direction that I'm pulling and the direction that I'm moving is zero, so this is just the magnitude of the force. So that's 50 kilograms times four or times 9.8 meters per second squared. That's about 490 newtons, multiplied by a displacement of three meters. So I have to do about uh, 1,470 joules of work in order to lift the couch up. That's option one. What's option two? Uh, option two is to use a ramp, right? So I still want to lift the block the same three meters. Um, uh, the same three meters. Uh, but now I can use a ramp that has some angle. And let me choose theta, uh, which is going to be about 5.7 degrees, which, as you'll see in a sec, I've chosen just to make the math work out a little bit easier. So the idea here is that you know I have this block. It still has a mass of 50 kilograms. Um, but now it's sitting on this incline. And we worked out up above uh, you know, how the force of gravity pulling straight down and the support force acting perpendicular to the slope leaves us with a net force um, that depends on the angle of our ramp, right? So we end up with a net force, uh, if we're not pushing on it, whose magnitude is like mg sine theta, right? So if we want to push the block up the hill, or up this ramp, uh, as long as we supply that same amount of net force, or even just a whisker more, uh, we'll be able to push it up, uh, push it up this incline. So the work that we're going to do in case two, which is again going to be uh, a force dotted into a displacement, but again I've chosen to exert a force in the direction of the slope, so this is just going to be the product of these two numbers. So on the one hand, the force that I need to exert here is less than it was when I was lifting straight up. I only need to supply uh, m times g times sine theta, um, but the trade-off is that I need to supply it over a longer distance, right? And if you work out the uh, the trigonometry here, what you find is that mg sine theta for this choice of uh, this choice of theta, uh, I just have to divide by ten. That's just forty nine newtons. But the penalty in going over a greater distance is that now instead of you know only applying this force for three meters, you can again work out this geometry. I have to apply it over thirty meters. Okay. And what you discover is that, in fact, the work that you do is exactly the same. You still have a total work, which is 1,470 uh, joules. Okay. Notice that both of these numbers, and in this one it's kind of particularly clear, um, 
are exactly equal to the change in gravitational potential energy that we're trying to uh, impart on this block. You know, the amount of work in case one is exactly the same as the amount of work in case two, and both of those are exactly the same as m times g times the change in height that I'm giving to this block by my efforts, right? So the important thing here is that the total amount of work that I need to do in these cases does not depend on the way that I perform that work. It doesn't depend on the way that I lift this block up to the second floor. All that matters is the total change in the potential energy that we're trying to do. So I could use a ramp, I could use a pulley, I could pull straight up, I could take an axe, chop the block up into tiny pieces, and throw the pieces up to the second floor. The amount of work involved in transferring the mass of the block up to the second story is the same in all of these cases. Even if the sets of forces and the sets of displacements over which I apply those forces um, are very different in all of these cases. Right? I actually think, you know, it's kind of nice to think about this uh, again, relative to our statement about the fact that energy is a conserved quantity, right? We're trying to change uh, the elevation of this massive object, uh, and in doing so, the couch is gaining gravitational potential energy. And we know that we can always convert gravitational potential energy back to kinetic energy, for instance, just by pushing the couch out the window and uh, letting it fall, right? And importantly, the amount of kinetic energy that it's going to acquire as it falls out of the window does not depend on the way we brought it up to the second story, right? Uh, you don't need to know, in like a deep sense, the details of every object's history to know what its resulting physical motions are going to be, precisely because energy is, is conserved. Okay. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this first uh, chapter on the basics of the laws of motion. We ran into the concept of inertia, the fact that objects want to resist changes uh, to their velocity. We saw Newton's three laws of motion, which codified first a precise statement about what inertia is in the first law, and then the details of how forces actually allow you to change velocities of objects. What is the relationship between a change of velocity, which is an acceleration, and a force? Newton told us that with the second law. And we understood in Newton's third law um, how an object exerting a force on something else um, has an equal and opposite reaction of that something else exerting a force back on the object. Uh, and then finally, we saw our first taste of a conserved quantity, the conservation of energy, and we defined work as this process of kind of shuffling energy around, transforming it from one form to another or from one object to another um, in one form or another.